<laughs> so welcome from me as well um, on Express Persistent Objects. That's my topic today, XPO, the Object Relational Mapping Tool uh, made by DevExpress with, well, I put this almost word in the title of the slideshow um, because I thought, after all, the tour may, may is perhaps not quite complete, you see what I mean, just in an hour's time, but I didn't want to promise too much. So I made it the almost complete tour. <laughs> now, um, to begin with, I've got just a few uh, words on myself, um, although, of course, Amanda said it all pretty much. Um, there is my blog address on the slide as well right there, and most importantly, down at the bottom, my email address, uh, because obviously I would love to get some feedback on this. Um, so if you thought it was great or it sucked, you know, then just let me know uh, and I'll appreciate it. There's also my Twitter uh, link, name, what you call it actually, at the top of the slide if you want to follow me there and maybe send some feedback, that's much appreciated. Now, um, meanwhile, you can read, so I assume you've learned whatever you want to learn about me personally, and we can then move on to the really important content tonight, which is vaguely this here. Um, I've written up this little agenda, basically giving some of the major topic points that I would like to cover tonight. Uh, I'm assuming that the, uh, the level of knowledge regarding XPO with my audience varies tonight um, and it's not going to be the same everywhere. Some of you presumably have used XPO before, some others maybe haven't used it at all. Um, I can hear somebody talking in the background which is a bit annoying to be honest. Uh, organizers, please stop doing that, thank you. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick introduction. Uh, some of the most important points really regarding how to use XPO, uh, how to declare your own persistent types, persisting them, getting them back and so on. And then I want to move on uh, when we get to the topics of, uh, well, querying for one thing, but also XPO layering, how the whole layer stack works in, in the Express Persistent Objects service publication as well as OData is all around the idea of making data available for use in your applications wherever they are, you know, whatever platforms they work on and so on. Um, yeah, that's basically my, my rough summary up front. I'm hoping it might be around an hour just like Amanda said, but of course um, with things like this it's always very hard to really tell, so uh, maybe we're just going to run over or maybe I haven't picked enough content and we're going to be done in half an hour. I don't think so, but you never know really, do you? Um, well, as she already said as well, questions in between. Uh, hopefully I'll remember to get back to them occasionally and um, otherwise we'll just handle everything in the end, at the end, whatever. Okay, so getting started. Now, oh, right, see, I almost forgot this good thing I put in the slide, right? Um, I do an XPO class, or I will do an XPO class um, in London in the UK in May this year. And if you want to follow this, the link on the slide, you can see all the information about it, lots of content and so on. This is a commercial class, unfortunately, so it does cost money, uh, I'm afraid to say. But I do have a special deal available for attendees of this webinar, which will be at the end of my slide deck obviously, right? Good trick. So wait for it. Okay, I put that in so I wouldn't forget and I haven't forgotten, so now I'm proud. Brilliant. Moving on to my actual content. Mainly for those of you who may not be using XPO so far, who've perhaps never had a look at it at all, um, what makes XPO interesting in the first place? Well, that is an interesting question, I would have to say, because there are so many different tools in that same market segment out there today, or at least uh, that's what it seems like for the, uh, the, the, the cursory uh, observer, I suppose, who doesn't look at a lot of details. You know, Microsoft, of course, has been in that space for quite a while now with their entity framework as well with uh, Link to SQL, which is not that important anymore, but, you know, two different products. And there are various other third-party products available, open source products as well, things like N-Hibernate and, you know, other commercial products. So what is it that sets XPO apart, of course? That is always a very interesting question. And I think... Um, in reality, to be honest, if there are many different good quality uh, alternatives available, one of the things to stress 
is always that your personal kind of taste for a particular philosophy in a product like this is very important. So maybe the last point, easy to use, should really be the first one because that is a pretty subjective thing and somebody may well disagree with me perhaps. Um, I think it's easy to use and I hope most other people do as well. But that's a bit of matter of taste in some ways and perhaps it also depends on the types of uh, scenarios you're trying to cover with a product like XPO. In any case, XPO is a very mature object relational mapping tool um, that focuses mainly on the idea of object persistence or code first methodologies, uh, meaning that the, the main focus of it is to target programmers who would like to write their own persistent types, um, you know, in code programmers being the people who write code, I suppose, that's what most of you will agree with, um, and then would like to persist that data that they've declared and modeled in uh, their code files into a database in some way, or rather persist the, the actual entities, the instances of that data that they create into the database. That is the scenario that is still covered best by XPO today. Um, it is, it, well, it has been evolved over time into a product that can also be used the other way around uh, quite well, really, by going back to an existing database, getting code created to interface with that existing database, um, you know, dealing with all the, the intricacies of working with existing database models. There's a lot of stuff around these ideas, really. Um, XPO is, on the other hand, highly database independent. And if you look at the market for object relational mapping tool, you will, tools, you will find that these two things rarely go hand in hand. Um, typically, you've either got products that are really good at working with existing databases, you know, looking at all the various different features that maybe SQL Server supports or Oracle supports or any other database backend and modeling those somehow on the code side. Um, or you find tools that, are, that focus more on being independent from the database backend, and these also tend to work from the top down much more regularly, as in modeling uh, entities in code and persisting them to, to, to the database and not the other way around. So these two things are slightly opposite, really. So you're you won't really find any tools, I hazard to say, um, that support both strategies equally well. Uh, for XPO, the first priority has always been the code first idea, and only the second one is the support for legacy databases, as I've called it, just not to say anything bad about those databases, just to say the databases come first, right? Um, I think I've got another comment about that on a later slide, so just to move on right now. XPO, being a coder's tool in many ways, is very well suited to agile practices. That is one final aspect I wanted to put on there. Um, so those entities you create can very easily be tested automatically using, you know, unit or functional testing approaches, whichever you prefer, really. So um, all those things are sort of go hand in hand, you know, the general philosophy of XPO and um, the way it works technically and so on. Right, so this is uh, my first summary right here. Now let's have a quick look at ways of defining persistent types. And we're going to see that in code in just a second, in case you're getting impatient already. So to define your own persistent types in XPO, you have to do something very simple. You have to create classes somehow. And you can either write these yourself, or you can import them from an existing database. I already mentioned that. And they may or may not derive from one of the particular base classes that come with the product. There's a variety of them. They've got different underlying features and so on. We're going to see a few examples of that in code in a second. Um, it is recommended to derive from one of those base classes for the simple reason that there is functionality in those base classes that you can benefit from. But of course, it, it is possible to, to just persist uh, independent object hierarchies. Um, some people find this very important. You've probably heard of the ideas of POCOs, 
P-O-C-O -O is what they spell this. Uh, I think these days it's supposed to mean plain old uh, CLR object. Or, you know, it used to be plain old C object or something. It doesn't really matter. You can persist these things as well, but it's not really that commonly done. Uh, because it is uh, semantically much harder to work with such entities uh, compared to where you've got all the utility functions and everything um, in, in your own classes in the instances directly and you can work with those right so that's why the recommendation is to use the existing base classes I've got this other point about importing from an existing database on here um, the fact that this is really intended as a one-time approach feature and I would like to compare this to other tools out there who've got the or which have the idea of uh, working with the database as a first priority in mind and in those cases what happens typically is that those those uh, products have got synchronization functionality right so they basically allow you to make changes on the database side as well at a later point in time and then not just get some classes generated once but even synchronize the changes you've made on the database side back into your classes at a later point in time hopefully you know without losing any of the changes you might have made in code meanwhile so th this is something that XPO doesn't really do that same way it's not really intended to go that way so that's why I put this uh, extra point in there um, the final thing I wanted to mention is about visual class designers. That's a question that comes up quite regularly about XPO. It is, as I said, intended to be a coder's tool. And if you're a real coder, you don't use visual class designers, right? Okay, just a joke. Maybe you do. But the point really is that they've, uh, they have created a product that is based on standard um, coding technologies. Meaning, for example, that um, you find um, attributes being used quite a lot with XPO in order to, uh, to to apply certain features onto fields and classes and so on and of course attributes are a standard mechanism these days in .NET so basically you can use any visual class designer you want to um, you, you want to use uh, like maybe the one that's built into Visual Studio as one example right so all these things are possible and there are there aren't really any limits um, I hear there might be some news about an actual native visual class designer for for XPO at some point in the not too far away future but uh, at least uh, you know you, you know where where most of us stand who use XPO we're, we're mainly about the coding side of things right so up to here and now I would like to show you some stuff in code so we get a good impression of what this whole XPO thing looks like uh, let me just switch here I hope you can now see my uh, Visual Studio right here in the front and um, I've already set up uh, a new project or I haven't actually created it yet but I'm now going to create it it's just going to be a boring standard console application you know for a start I've got some other uh, demos a little later on it's going to be called XPO Webinar Persistent Classes, and that's all. I'm just going to create this new project. There we go. And um, now, the, I need to do just one thing, basically. When we get to the point of using UI applications with XPO and all these things, then you can rely on Visual Studio to add all the necessary references to your project uh, by just uh, dragging UI components onto your forms you know and it'll it'll add those references automatically but it, since I'm using a console application for the demo I actually need to add those references myself um, I've done so earlier so let's just add the same ones I want the data.v10.2 that's my 10.2 XPO or other general dev express data assembly and I'll take the XPO 10.2 as well always match the versions when doing this right you're aware of this I suppose I'm gonna take the link one as well I don't need the providers one the providers one is for additional database backends that I don't really have installed in my current virtual machine anyway so never mind those at the moment if you want uh, you know support for MySQL or Postgres SQL and stuff like that that's what that's the assembly you need to refer to uh, but in this case I can do without those right close that and we're all set basically 
Now, to create actual classes with XBO, um, I just, you know, write classes as a coder. So let's see. I come up. I've come up with this idea of doing some products. So I'm just going to use a template here and call that thing a product. Right? Uh, that's how easy that is. If you don't use a template, well, you're just going to have to create that class some other way. But of course, if you are a DevExpress customer, you you quite likely got access to the Code Rush templates yourself. So, XC, like I just did. Let me just repeat that for you. XC space will expand into a new persistent class using a standard XPO template. Um, what else? There are a few things we can see with this product class. The first thing being that it derives from a particular base class. I mentioned that a moment ago. This is one of the standard XPO base classes that you can use. Uh, if I drill into this, you can see some of the other ones. There's also an XP custom object class, for example. You can see some of the specialties that the XP object has compared to the custom object and so on. There are also documentation pages in the help, right, if you get confused by this, just to show you some things quickly. Uh, there is an OID field on the XP object, for instance, which is the automatic primary key, right? So the XP object has one, the custom object doesn't. That's one of the main differences. We can drill down further in here. There's also a base object class. Uh, there are other differences right here. For, in, for instance, the custom object implements deferred deletion, whereas the base object does not, right? So these are the differences, or some of them, between uh, some of the existing standard base classes. You can basically select any one of those. You can even go further down the hierarchy and derive from, where are we, from persistent base directly. Um, you may want to do that if you're on Silverlight, for instance. There are some specialties in that regard. So it's really your choice. And the differences between those types are to what extent certain standard functionality is automatically supported by these types. Right? So that's what you have to think about or just look up in the, doc in, in the documentation uh, whenever it comes to the decision of which type exactly to use for your own base classes. In some cases, it even makes it makes uh, sense to think about creating your own type as a base class for all your own persistent uh, classes when you want some of the standard functionality and maybe some other helpful features that you introduce yourself. Right, um, one other thing to mention, there is one standard constructor in here and it uses a session type variable to pass through to the base class. Now this is the recommended template. Um, sometimes on the DevExpress website there are some really old articles and how-to things around. Well, hopefully not too many these days, but it does happen. Uh, that also show things like a default constructor, that is the one that doesn't have any parameters. It is not recommended to use that anymore these days because uh, that is basically a legacy XPO version 1 sort of thing that we don't really want to use anymore today. Uh, all objects should always have a reference to session to a session context these days, which is quite important for many of the inner workings of XPO and handling sessions explicitly is also something you should do these days, which is not, it hasn't always been such a big recommendation, but it's been like that for several years now. So that is really what you should do. Okay, now of course, a product like this would have to have some sort of properties in order to give it some meaningful data. And I'm going to introduce one to the product for a start, I'm going to call this uh, name, right? And I'm using a template one more time, which I was called XPS. It stands for XPO Property of Type String, right? XPS. Nothing sinister in there. Uh, this is basically a boring standard .NET property with one single difference compared to other boring standard .NET properties, which is that the, the set uses a helper function called set property value in here. And this helper function basically um, you, uh, does change notification in the background, right? So that's basically what it does. You could theoretically do this yourself, or you could um, just uh, change uh, certain details of this and, and handle it a different way, or whatever, right? It's just a convenience feature, basically, that, that hopefully you'll find useful. What else uh, did I want to say about this? Let me just have a quick look, look at my notes. Uh, that's okay. Let's just move on for now. Now, 
with this product, I can go and actually create an instance of it. Um, and in order to do so, I need to create a transaction context. I'm using the so-called unit of work context. There are several different classes. I've got a few more things to say about that later on that can serve as the transaction context for a particular uh, or, or for the creation of new objects in this case. Uh, unit of work is a class that derives from session. Right, so I can use it as a parameter to the constructor. If I just go, uh, let's say I, I like rubber chickens, you know, so I'm going to create a rubber chicken product and go a uh, new product of uh, UOW, and then I'm going to set the name of this thing as well, which of course is going to be rubber chicken. Right, fair enough. Now, um, the final thing I have to do in order to actually persist something is commit my changes to this unit of work thing. So the unit of work basically gathers all the different uh, uh, changes that are being done within its own context, whether these are additions or changes to property values or perhaps uh, uh, you know deletions, whatever they are. And once I commit these changes, they are all persisted at once. So this basically opens and closes one database transaction at the point where my commit changes call is being done. The unit of work itself is a an application side transactional context, right? That's how that works. And if, presumably, my unit of work somehow runs out of the using scope, so out of this block, without commit changes ever being called, then a rollback is performed automatically, so to speak. Um, since it all just takes place in memory up to that point, there's nothing really magical going on, but all the changes are dropped or reverted, whichever way you want to look at it. So that's how these things work. Okay, so assuming I'm done with this, let's just run this little application, and um, it's done, right? Nothing bad happened there, obviously. Um, so let's see. When I look into my, uh, where is it, into my binary directory here, debug, uh, there should be a file in here called web, XPO Webinar Persistent Classes, so that's the base name of my product, uh, project, uh, .mdb. Just double click this, and it'll open up, uh, or maybe it won't open up, you never know, maybe it'll just come up with an undefined error. Uh, oh, access coming up, that's what I thought would happen, to be honest, fair enough. Enable content, and you can see, that there's a product table in that database and it has been created oops, for me automatically. I was just going to resize this a bit. There we go. So you can see the rubber chicken has actually made it into, uh, uh, into my, my database table, right? So all the structural stuff has been done for me. Now, just quickly, something that you always want to do is have slightly more complex scenarios in your database structure, right? So I I thought I'd introduce well uh, another class, perhaps called order line. So somebody might go ahead and order some of those products. Right? Each each uh, single order line is going to have a count, um, and it's going to have a reference to a product um, using uh, XPA uh, shortcut for that one. So and um, just call this product, and the type of it is also oops product managed to type that. There we go. Now the only difference to the uh, standard property we've seen before is that there is an attribute called association on this product property. The association has got a name which is kind of important because there could be uh, several different associations between the two uh, same types, right? So that's an important detail really. That name also gets used on the database side for to, to name the association itself. So you can you can find this in there depending a little bit on the actual uh, database backend that you use. And uh, on the other side of this association, let's see here in my product class, I'm going to have uh, an opposite of that association thing. So from this point of view, I'm going to have a list of order lines. Let me just complete this. There we go. And this list of order lines has all the order lines related to any particular product, right? So that's how that works, one side and the other side. And my templates take care of, of getting this association attribute right. If you do this manually, this is where you have to pay attention. So the name product-order lines has to be the same on both sides of my association, right? My template does this automatically. 
Now there's a helper function being used called get collection, which basically automatically retrieves all the related items that belong to this particular product when it comes to the order line association. Now let's add a few more uh, uh, pieces of data right here. So uh, let's say maybe I'm going to have an order line uh, for this new product. This is a new order line, same oops, uh, unit of work right here. And oh, that was not supposed to happen. There we go. Let's say somebody orders a few uh, rubber chickens. Let's say they want 10 of them, right? Because rubber chickens are cool. Product. Um, I can't type product today, can I? Okay, there we go. Rubber chicken products, uh, 10 of them. And that is all I need to do. So let's run this whole thing again. There we are. Okay, all gone through and back into my MDB database and there is now a table with order lines in there as well. Uh, let's have a look inside. There we go. It says count 10 product 2. That is the reference into my product table. So of course I've now created a second rubber chicken object, right? So because I, I didn't put in any code to see if it was already there or anything like that. I could do that, of course, but I haven't. Um, and what you can also see on the side of, of access in this case is that the relationships between those two tables are set up exactly the way you think they would be. Uh, double click this here to see that the OID value on the product table corresponds to the product value on the order line table right? in a one to many relationship. So that's exactly what we would have expected on the basis of the persistent object declaration we've created. Fair enough. Um, now I thought I'd closed access. There we go. It's gone. Brilliant. Now, um, what else was I going to show? Right. After you've persisted objects and you've basically declared these types and created instances and everything, of course, the one thing you really want to do is get them back somehow, right? So uh, let's let's create just a little more information. Let's say in, together with my rubber chicken, of course, I need pulleys, right? So of course, if you don't have a clue why I'm doing things with rubber chickens and pulleys, I, I suggest you use the almighty Google to find out, right? Just to mention that in between. Um, and uh, let's say I want to do some more order lines because we're going to run out of these things and somebody ordered uh, 10 pulleys to go with their 10 rubber chickens and then maybe we've got another order for four rubber chickens and eight pulleys because they tend to wear out you know oops um, hold on oh, that was not right pulley right there we go so if you use your pulley a lot it's gonna wear out so you need new pulleys and there we go so we've got these things and now let's say we would like to get some of them back right so maybe we're interested in those orders that are very small ones because we think that you know sending extra advertising to those uh, customers who do the, the small orders would help perhaps so let's say we would like to do some querying so I create a new context I could theoretically use the existing one, only I like just keeping things in those modular blocks, basically, you know, uh, working with a, a, a unique context every time I start doing something new. A uh, matter of taste, perhaps, but I like doing it like that. Now, some simple querying features can be accessed just by going UOW dot and then using functionality like the find object functions and things like that. that that's quite useful. Um, one of the older systems is using the XP collection. So I could do something like var small order lines is what this should say equals new XP collection of uh, order line. And then um, I'm going to pass in oops, a reference to my unit of work. And I'm also going to pass in something called a binary operator. So I could do something like this, binary operator, uh, resolve the namespace, and then go count, comma, five, comma, binary operator type, uh, less, something like that, right? So I assume you have an idea what this does, basically. It creates a collection of order line objects, and it specifies a criteria to work uh, against this collection. So I should only retrieve, uh, let's output what I get, uh, I should only retrieve those order lines right now whose count value is less than five, uh, quite obviously I suppose. So let's see if I'm just going to do right line 
uh, oops, okay, zero sold one times, something like that, and then go line dot product dot name, comma, line dot count. This should give me a list of all those order lines. Oh, well, maybe it's just going to fail, right? So uh, let's see. Oh, I copied these things, didn't I? That's true. So let's just reuse the existing order line uh, value. You see, since I'm associating these order lines with the unit of work during that creation, it is not necessary to, uh, to, re to have the reference to the order line around because the reference will be stored within the, uh, the context of the unit of work, right? I wouldn't necessarily recommend reusing variables like this just to be sure, but in this case, I'm sure we'll be fine, right? So let's run this again. And it says, rubber chicken sold four times, which would be pretty much what we expect because all the other order lines I created actually have a count that is larger than five. So this one is the only one whose count is smaller than five, and that's the only one as well that uh, basically gets returned from my little query. Fair enough. Now, as I said, this is kind of the old system right here, but at the same time, it is also the system that is still being used today at the basis of the entire criteria system that XPO has. Uh, what you typically do today, though, would be something more along those lines right here. So let's do the small order line thing again, and I'm going to create a thing that's called the XP query, and the XP query is the XPO interface to link, right? Oh, now I made a mistake right here. I should have started going something like from line in new XP query because we're doing link, right? And I can go where line dot count smaller five select uh, line, for instance. Okay, and this query should of course give me the same result, quite obviously. Well, I get two of them now because I've recreated uh, one of them uh, the second time round, obviously, fair enough. Uh, but, but, you know, this query syntax is basically the same as the one above. It returns all the items with the count smaller 5. This gets compiled by XPO, uh, by uh, compile is maybe not the right word, but it gets converted by XPO into this same criteria-based system that we've seen before. There are other options in between, but we don't have enough time to look at all of them. So this is my little introduction. Uh, having a quick look at creating your own persistent types, persisting some of them, and getting them back from your database. Okay, so any questions at this point, basically? Just one or two, perhaps, that we can quickly answer. Anything for me, Amanda? Um, yeah, let, let's see, from Jeff. What's the difference between UOW unit of work and discrete unit of work? Uh, um, is that, re okay, I, I'm not 100% sure I do understand the question, but this unit of work thing here is the type, and UOW is just the name of my variable right here, in, in case that was the question. Perhaps I'm using var, so of course I could do unit of work UOW equals new unit of work instead. It's just a bit repetitive, and so I prefer using var myself, but so that maybe that's what the question was about. He says, or maybe it is explicit. I, I don't know if that helps you. Mm. No, nope, um, I'm not sure. Jeff, <laughs> send me an email or maybe get back to it later unless uh, I'm, I'm not really understanding the question, I'm afraid. Uh, let's see, for Marv, how does a uh, unit of work handle DB connections? When you query a DB with XP query, does the unit of work open a connection and enclose it after the results are returned? Okay, uh, pretty good question. We'll, we'll probably see more about that in the layering topic in just a minute, but basically the unit of work doesn't care at all about the database. It just uses, um, it, it just basically goes back to, um, a, well, an underlying element called the data layer, and the data layer at some point, of course, creates a connection, but typically you will have the connection set up before you ever get to this point. Um, yes. I see a comment down there, by the way, that says an explicit unit of work. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm actually aware of that class. Is that something I should know? Maybe it is. Um, I'm just not afraid to admit I'm not really familiar with it. Doesn't well, say. I sent uh, <laughs> Jeff, who asked the questions, uh, we have documentation on explicit unit of work. So I sent him okay. a link. So hopefully that helps, Fair Jeff, enough. if it doesn't let us know. 
Um, how do you query data that is not yet committed to the database? Um, there is is a way with the, for example, on the basis of the XP collection, let me show you this right here. Um, oops, now it's gone. Uh, there we go. The XP collection right here takes a parameter on one of its overloads. Uh, let's see where it is. I think it's the first parameter. Here we go. The persistent criteria evaluation behavior that it allows you to basically uh, tell the, the collection to, to, re to get information back that has not really been persisted to the database in addition to that, of course, which has been persisted. So by doing so, you can run queries that return result sets which are partly persisted already and partly have not been persisted yet. Uh, let's see. How do you use dependency injection with XPO? How do I use dependency injection with XPO? Uh, that's an interesting question. I I wouldn't necessarily think there's very much to say about that, to be honest, because dependency injection basically means that I'm going to pass in dependencies from the outside instead of creating them myself. I'm, I mean, I can perfectly imagine using dependency injection with XPO in case that helps in any way. I just can't quite imagine what the question is targeted at. I wouldn't see any, any really particular uh, points of interface between those two technologies. Okay, and uh, or we'll conflict or anything, you know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm not sure. Um, what is the difference between commit changes and commit transaction? Oh, um, commit transaction is a, is a, a method on, the, on the, the session base class which refers to the actual database transaction, whereas commit changes is a method on the, on the level of the unit of work which triggers this automated uh, handling of all the collected changes that the unit of work is aware of. And a, a, a commit changes internally at some point creates its own database side transaction and then also commits it. But uh, you have the choice of working with the session class instead of unit of work, which is a little low level, a more low level, and allows you to handle those transactions manually. Come to think of it, I'm not 100% sure, but this may be related to the explicit unit of work as well. I've, I've been sort of uh, pondering this in my mind, and I think the explicit unit, unit of work might be one that has a special kind of behavior uh, with regard to transaction handling as well. So this also goes hand in hand. I have to admit, though, that these days I use the standard unit of work almost exclusively, which is why these other things I would probably recommend against, unless you have a very specific reason for needing to handle transactions uh, manually instead of automatically. Okay. Uh, do you have time for, you have a few more questions. I don't know if you want to hold off on them or... Um, well, if they, if they fit in right now, I suppose it's maybe better than handling them later. So, yeah, keep it going. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Let's see from George. What's the difference between a session and a unit of work? Right, yeah, I, I suppose I probably explained that already. So the unit of work derives from session, and session used to be the only thing XPO had at some point. It was never removed, although, I, I, as I said, I wouldn't normally see a lot of use for it these days. I rarely use it myself. The difference when it comes to functionality is that the unit of work uh, tracks changes and collects things it needs to do automatically, whereas the uh, the, the session basically uses uh, well no tracking of any description. Uh, you can use it to to control database side transactions manually and handle things that way, um, but it's a lot more manual work. It doesn't have any automatic uh, change collection or anything like that. <laughs> the unit of work basically is an implementation of Martin Fowler's pattern of the same name. So if you search for that uh, online, and it's uh, I forget what Martin Fowler's URL is, but all that information is available online. And this, this unit of work in XPO is basically along the lines of his unit of work pattern that he suggests in his uh, writings. Uh, awesome. I um, I don't know. This may not make sense to you. How do you use How do you use identity big int in classes of XPO? 
how do I use identity big int? So I suppose this probably refers to a particular database type. Um, well, generally speaking, if you're if you're really serious about XPO and its database independence and stuff like that, you probably wouldn't use that at all because you'd rather use types that translate between one database backend and the other. But theoretically speaking, you can influence the types of fields. For example, if I would like a different type of database field mapping for my count right here, I could use the attribute DB type and put in the, the name of the database type that I would like to use in here explicitly. Um, I wouldn't usually recommend doing that, and in my experience it's rarely necessary, but it's definitely possible. And it's also possible to do this on the on the basis of the so-called connection provider, the the the, uh, the class in the XPO stack. I'm going to get to in a moment uh, that basically takes care of the database specific communication. Uh, that would be the place perhaps to go and sort of define certain standard behavior. If you if you want to work with one of the standard databases, but you're not happy with some of the standard type choices that are being made for that particular database. Uh, you you could uh, derive your own connection provider class and use it to override some of the standard behavior that way. Great. We'll do one more before you move on. Where do you connect to access from Peter? Yes. Well, that's a very good question, and I'm going to show you how to connect to SQL Server pretty much next. Uh, I haven't okay. so far done anything to connect to Access, which is a, a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get to that in a second. Okay. Um, okay. Do you want to move on? Well, we can. If you, I don't know how much you've got. Uh, well, we have a few more questions, but I'm just afraid that yeah, we, we're going to we get through your original demo, right. right? So fair enough. Let's just move on for now, and we can see. Maybe I'm going to answer some things because that's, of course, only been the first step, really. So, uh, all right, let me just uh, switch back to my slides for a minute. There, um, we've seen defining types, persisting data, querying. Now, my next uh, point right here to sort of catch up on some of the topics I've mentioned in between. There are a lot of features in XPO that deal with uh, options for defining your types, and I've listed a bunch of them here. There's probably lots more. Uh, just to say, just to mention a few. So, how to build my class hierarchy would be my first point because. Uh, I've just shown you only uh, specific types derived from one of the standard classes, and I haven't really gone into deriving your own hierarchies. You can do these things and thereby basically split your types over uh, separate database tables, for example. And there are also ways, that's what the point means, define hierarchy accumulation. There are also ways of defining uh, where in your hierarchy the values sort of come together. So you can have several derived types, for example, that are somehow only spread across one or two tables, right? For instance, so there are lots of different ways of influencing these things, uh, typically using attributes one more time. Um, some, of the, some of the features, we've seen deferred deletion just very quickly. There's an attribute that activates deferred deletion on a particular type. Of course, theoretically speaking, you could uh, change this or keep this different between different types. Uh, typically, well, there are, there are cases where you do this, but it's more of an exceptional thing, really. You typically decide to go with or without deferred deletion and then perhaps make a few exceptions depending on your types. Um, deferred deletion, just in case somebody doesn't really associate anything with that term, means that if you delete an object, it doesn't, it isn't actually deleted immediately, but instead it stays around until it's purged, you know, that sort of behavior. Um, then we've got optimistic locking as well, which is, of course, a well-known standard pattern. By default, the XPO object, the XPO class is implemented, but you, it's, it's, you can toggle it on and off again. You can influence exactly how it works, which field it uses for the uh, deferred deletion stuff, and so on. Um, then we've got field level features like associations. We've seen those. You can do aggregation by you know, basically aggregating related object into the master object. It, that has 
bit to do with performance related uh, details as well when it comes to how data is being queried in which batches and so on. Um, XPO can perform value conversions, so you can basically use a different representation of data on your in, on your code side compared to uh, the representation on the database side using some intelligent mechanism in between that converts the values from one representation into another. You can use that for encoding and stuff as well. You've got lazy loading support or delayed loading, basically delayed properties is the, the term to look out for if you're interested in that, um, which allows you to, to defer the loading of certain property values, typically because they are big, uh, like for example for blob fields or, or images or whatever you have. Um, We've seen the support for primary keys on the basis of the standard integer. Uh, there's also support for GUID type in there. I think I saw a question at some point in between uh, that, that referred to using a long type. So I don't think the long type is currently supported out of the box, but it's quite simple and there are uh, knowledge base articles on how to do it to use any uh, other type as your primary key type if you like. You just basically derive from a different base class and put in your own key and so on. Very simple to do. And there is support for so-called persistent alias fields which allow you to, to create server-side calculated properties on your objects. Cool stuff as well. Right, so lots of things like that. Um, the querying data, we've seen some of those options, most of them actually. Uh, you can parse queries from strings. I haven't shown that one. I'm not really that, that happy about that myself. I wouldn't recommend that too much. The XP view thing can be quite interesting. It's, uh, it's a possibility of doing a subset of the functionality of projection using calculated values in queries as well and things like that. Um, the, 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 the typical way of querying today would be link. Um, there are some other things in between. I haven't listed everything on this slide. If you're, uh, if you're on a platform that doesn't support link for one thing, you may be interested in, in using different querying techniques. But of course these days I suppose that's really quite rare, so I'd recommend link for the vast majority of cases. Uh, one big advantage of working directly with the criteria operator uh, structure is that you can easily handle it from code because it's so simple to sort of create and nest those various uh, criteria with one another and, and so somehow create your own querying infrastructure from code with dynamic queries that will be executed at runtime. Right, so just to complete these things. Now, looking at the data layer stack, um, this is one thing that I was talking about before. We've basically got those connection providers at the bottom of the stack. Uh, these are database specific, so you've got a, a bunch of them depending on the types of databases you would like to interact with. There are actually some different ones for SQL Server, for instance, with a bit of optional functionality in there occasionally. Uh, above those, you've got several uh, wrappers of type iDataStore. This iDataStore interface is actually the one that's implemented by the connection providers as well. And you can create what I'd like to refer to as the iDataStore onion because you can wrap iDataStores into other iDataStores and there is no limit basically to the amount of wrapping you can do. There are a few standard uh, iDataStore implementing classes included with XPO like the DataStore fork and the logger for, for instance on the, on that's mentioned on the right hand side of the slide. Um, it is also possible to publish an iData store through some sort of a remote communication interface. I've got an example of that in a second, but it uses the, uh, the, 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 the interface a little higher up, the iCache to cache communication core. The iData store can be used the same way. It's just not quite that common, perhaps, to do so. Now, above the iData store onion, you can have, so the yellow parts are basically optional parts, uh, you can have uh, wrappers around this this onion thing um, of type data cache root and then several if necessary data cache nodes. Now these things are for the feature of data layer caching. They basically provide caching functionality on the basis of well SQL queries is maybe the best association really although that's not really correct technically speaking because there's no SQL being used on that level it's all an abstract representation of the queries that go through the wire right so that's what you're caching on that level basically 
And this infrastructure can also be split again, there's another little cloud, uh, at the point between the cache root and the cache node. So a server somewhere can basically create a data cache root and publish it as a service to be used from somewhere else using a data cache node. And you can create whole hierarchies of these things uh, if necessary in very complex situations because each cache can be tuned to a certain behavior to, to, to specify how long certain content is going to be cached on that particular level. So you can have short-lived uh, data blocks in your application as opposed to longer lived ones and so on. So that's uh, this part of the functionality. And on top of that you've got the so-called data layer. And the data layer is typically created just once if you can. Um, that is for each application instance typically. Um, there are two standard implementations called the simple data layer, which is the one you'll, you'll typically use in interactive applications like on Windows Forms, for example. Um, and there's also the thread safe data layer, which you will typically use in scenarios where you need several threads to access um, the same data at the same time. The reason being that the data layer is the point where all XPO metadata is collected. So all the information XPO has about the different types you're working with and so on um, is collected on the data layer level which means that because XPO fills those those data structures on the fly usually um, in multi-threaded scenarios, you need to pre-fill those and have them all available before your application even gets started because otherwise multiple threads could collide on this particular level, which is the reason why there is a simple data layer and a thread-safe data layer, right? So, um, moving on from here, let me show you another quick example for the things you can do on this level right here. Um, first, I would like to show you what somebody asked before, how to connect to a particular database because we're still basically working with the fallback solution right now. Um, the fallback solution is, uh, as, you, as you saw, access or a JET database system, uh, but you can replace this with any other one and it's quite simple to do so typically or well, sometimes, depending on the complexity of your setup, it only requires one line of code. Well, I'm going to break it around, so never mind. I'm going to set the data layer of this thing to a new data layer, uh, XPO default get data layer. And um, I can pass in a few different parameters to my data layer. The one I really want is a, con a connection string. So I'm just going to get back to my connection provider and I'm picking the one for SQL Server right now because I've got one running locally. Um, MS SQL connection provider dot get connection string and let's just pass in my local server and the database called oops, uh, XP uh, webinar. Yeah, that's, that's a nice name. I was actually going to put that in quotes. There we go. And then um, the final thing I need is the auto create option to say, is the schema for this database supposed to be created automatically or not? And so on. Right? So you can configure this by default uh, when you're a developer and working with your database like I do right now. I can just use database and schema to get everything created automatically. There are lots of limits to this, so don't get this wrong. It's not meant to be used in, in deployment, basically, right, or only in a very coordinated fashion. Uh, but at least during development time, it's, it's a very easy way of working with your database to just get it all handled automatically by XPO. Right, so with this little change in place, I'm going to run the application again. Oh, and it doesn't work. What am I doing wrong? Small order lines already defined. Oh, of course, I, I did uh, remove the comment from this one right here. Try that again. There we go. And it takes a second to go back to my uh, SQL Server, presumably. And then it says I've sold four rubs for chickens one more time. Let's have a quick look at my data connection right here. Um, there it is already, XPO Webinar Persistent Classes. That's the one, isn't it? Uh, let's see. SQL Server dot, and then we've got XPO Webinar Persistent Classes. You know, normally it never automatically inserts this. Oh, that was the MDB file. See, I'm confusing myself. 
So this is the SQL Server file, and here's the same structure in there that I previously had on the access uh, basis, right? So this is how that works. Let me just close this, because otherwise sometimes you get confused afterwards. Um, I can just exchange one connection provider for another one. Now, I can also wrap these things, and just to show you a very quick example of that, let's say I want um, a, a connection provider, um, connection provider, like this, and I can use XPO default to uh, retrieve one, get connection provider, and it's using the same um, parameters as my previous call right here. So I can basically use my connection string and my auto create option, database and schema, to get hold of a connection provider, right? But I can also wrap this. So for example, I could do a new data store, uh, where is it, logger, there we are. Should have typed it, shouldn't I? Data store logger, pass in my connection provider, and then pass in another parameter, which in this case I'll set to console.out, for example, which is the output text writer for my console, obviously. And now my uh, data layer I'm going to create by saying data layer equals new simple data layer, and I'll pass in the connection provider I've already created. So this would be the way, for example, of uh, creating one of those iData store onions that I was referring to, you know, uh, in order to, to basically put, put several different iData store implementations together. In this case, the data store logger will output everything that XPO does on the wire, basically, on this abstract iData store basis, will output all these things on the console, typically for debugging purposes, before actually executing. Right, so just an example of these things. Now, um, I'm going to switch at this point to a different demo that I've prepared, if I can manage to open it. There we go, uh, data store publication. This one takes things a little further um, because I've gone ahead and actually created a data service application right here. It's still a boring console application that uh, can create a connection provider. We've seen that happen. And it also uses a little function down here in, in a demo data to put a little bit of data into the database. It's very similar to what we've already seen before. Uh, there's a bug in here, actually. I saw that earlier and corrected. Never mind. And um, what else? Uh, right, I move on to create a data store logger. So we've got the same thing here, again, step by step. Right, to wrap this into a console logger. And I'm also using one of those data cache root things that we haven't seen before. Now, on top of that, the data cache root implements, let me just show you this um, somewhere, the, this interface that I was talking about, the iCache-to-Cache communication core interface, right? And I've gone ahead and created a proxy implementation for this iCache to cache communication core, and it's down here somewhere in my utility library, cache data store proxy. So this thing implements a contract, which is a WCF contract in this case, because I like to use WCF for publication. Here it is, you know, just a tiny little thing with lots of WCF attributes on, on it. Um, my proxy implements this contract, and I'm wrapping my cache root in this proxy object. And then I go publish it through WCF, you know, standard service host functionality and so on. I could be using different types of protocols and whatever else in here, obviously. Uh, I'm using a TCP binding, but it could be anything else, really. Um, and by doing so, I basically publish my contract for consumption elsewhere. Let's just run this to see that it works. It should, uh, should just say service published. Fair enough. Now, let's just leave this running. And I've also got a client application in here. The client application is a WCF application, uh, sorry, WPF application, that is. And on its initialization, it uses the same or very similar WCF code to initialize its own TCP binding, and it's got its own channel factory for the iCache-to-Cache communication core contract. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Connecting to this URL that I've published my service on, and it's got a client side cached data store proxy, which again, just for completeness sake down here, is this one here. 
It implements the iCash to Cash Communication Core interface and it wraps a contract interface of the same kind. So we've got the two ends of a communication connection basically um, that work together through, through this publication scenario and on this side I've got the opposite data cache node so if you vaguely remember the slide I was showing that's exactly what I'm doing right now and on top of that I can initialize my XPOD4 data layer with my own simple data layer. So I've now, you know, pushed all those other yellow elements into this stack at this point, and I've gone ahead and split the whole thing physically in between. So when I run my application, it is going to bind its WPF window to an instance of this data source class, which basically retrieves a collection of order line objects from my database on the way through this connection. So now my window is empty, just watch for that, and when I run my WPF application, let's just put this in the foreground meanwhile, there we go, my application will come up quite soon, there we go, and you saw that it actually went back through the communication connection to the server side and retrieved the information that I can now see in my little WPF window right here. It's all put into a wrap panel and stuff, whatever, you know, nothing, nothing really interesting about that. It's just the boring standard XAML page that binds to some data uh, and displays it just using standard data binding mechanisms and things like that um, to work with that data through my remote connection. Now, of course, this whole remote connection could be, you know, on a server um, on the other side of the world, uh, maybe through an HTTP connection, whatever WCF lets you do, basically you can do with this thing as well. Quite cool, I think. Right, um, to summarize that, so back to my slides for a moment. Um, I think I would probably like to go ahead since we're, we're running out of time already. It's amazing how time flies when you enjoy yourself. So I, th I think I'm probably just going to go through uh, one more little demo which isn't really that long and then show some more slides and we can handle a few questions at the end so hopefully most of you will be able to stay long enough uh, I, I promise not to keep you too much longer hopefully so um, I was going to to give you this little piece of information about what what happens on top of my data layer so the, the top of the last tack that I was showing uh, is the, the data layer implementation, which has an interface itself, it's called iData layer. And for a while now, there's also been the so-called iObject layer implementation on top of that. Uh, for a while now actually means only since um, version 10.2, so not really that long at all. This iObject layer is, a, is an, another point where uh, you can you can put in a tier separation. Uh, the details of which are still you know quite hard to figure out. There's not the most fantastic documentation available for it yet. Um, I've just really started looking into the depths of these things, and I'm going to blog about it a little bit later on. Hopefully, docs are going to improve as well. Very interesting anyway to be able to do uh, to get a split into your tier architecture. Um, for the purpose of actually working with the object implementations because previously we were still on the level of the queries albeit uh, abstracted queries but it was still a query level and on this level we're on the object level where we can work with the actual objects while they move back and forth through the wire sort of like an application server n tier sort of scenario right the object layer always exists these days you can, if you want to, create it explicitly, but it's always there. It just gets automatically inserted in there if you don't create it explicitly. And on top of it, finally, sits what we've been seeing the entire time, uh, the unit of work or the session or any of these things, which, as I already said, implement um, the, the, uh, the, the change tracking. I just lost my th myself there. The change tracking uh, and also, very importantly, things like the identity map, for example, another one of Martin Fowler's pattern, if you're not familiar with it. Um, that is always available, even on the session level, the identity map, just as an example. 
uh, implements the sort of feature where an object, if you retrieve it more than once, will only ever be created once on, on the application side. So if you retrieve the same object, so to speak, more than once, you get back the same instance, right? So that is not in the sense of caching. It's just well, a, a really necessary feature in your application to prevent different copies of an object hanging around within the same context in various different incarnations, so to speak. Now, um, multi-tier support, I've gone into all these things, I suppose, on the basis of this iData store or iCache to cache communication core. Um, we can publish an XPO connection, an XPO service through any sort of remote invocation technology. There are samples on the blogs. I wrote most of those myself, actually, for XML Web Services, WCF, remoting, actually, that's the old style technology. Even for REM objects, I remember writing one of these things. Um, you can also go one level higher, which I've just uh, tried to summarize this on the basis of iSerializable Object Layer. More information about that to come up in the future. And then uh, one thing more that I would like to show you just very quickly is publishing um, data through a, a WCF data service that, that publishes OData, which I think is a very cool extension to XPO that's been around for a while. Azrit uh, wrote most of that, I understand, um, and I like it. So I thought I'd just quickly demonstrate it. It's very, very quickly done, really. Um, I don't want to go through the process of actually creating it myself. I could. It's, it's not that hard, but I just I already assumed we were not going to have enough time to really look into all those details. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like when it's done. Oh, uh, maybe I'm just going to crash Visual Studio, though. You never know. Uh, so we're going to have to wait for it. Does anybody know a joke, maybe, or anything like that? No. Okay. Quick question, anyone? Like the one of those 18-second questions while you open a <laughs> new project? Uh, let's see. Yes, Jose says, I use XPO with WCF and my service always times out. Can you give me any okay. recommendations? set up the service by yes. uh, okay. it's, a, it's a matter of setting certain configuration properties of your WCF service correctly. I can never remember all the names of those millions of options that WCF offers, but it's a pretty common thing and there is basically a timeout that kicks in in WCF after a while, so that's the sort of thing you should be looking out for. Hopefully that helps. Otherwise, shoot me an email and I'll try to find it. I've got samples for it somewhere. Right. That was the 18 second question. Good job, Amanda. <laughs> so, <laughs> back to my final little demo on, on OData here. So, uh, we've seen this stuff with the data service and my WPF client and all that, so I left this in here. But I've also got this thing called the OData service in here as well. And the OData service is basically just a, a, a naked web application project with a, a WCF data service added in through the standard template. And what you get when you do this, it looks somewhat like this here, where you've got a class implemented, uh, I called it orders because that's what I retrieve basically. I derive this from XPO data service. The standard template has a comment in here saying something like, you need to remember to insert your own type in here or whatever. So that's what I did basically. I inserted XPO data service, which is a, a class be, that is declared in the assembly DevExpress XPO data dot services that comes with XPO these days, right? So um, I've also got the connection string attribute on here, which uh, allows the whole system to refer to a connection string that I put in web.config. This refers to the same demo database that I've been using the entire time. You can retrieve those connection strings from the connection providers, like I demonstrated earlier, and I just took one and popped it in there. And in this particular case, I also need to register the entities that are supported by my OData service because they are in, different, in a different assembly from my service itself, right? If, if they were in the same, I wouldn't have to do anything. But since they're in a different one, I have to do this. Now, if I make this here my default project, uh, where is it? Startup project. And also remember to switch to Chrome because Internet Explorer always shows this rather odd interface when it comes to uh, using uh, no data service. I can't really make head or tail of that. So let's see. If I do uh, orders.service for a start, just like this here, 
Um, I see, well, just the, the headers for my types that, that are in my, my service. So if I go order line instead, something like this, I get back some XML, basically, atom data in this case that shows all the content from my database. And I can do something like order line of one, for example, to just retrieve one of them, or go product, right? That's the product related, my first order line, or go name under that, you know, to just retrieve my rubber chicken value, right? So very cool. This is how OData works, of course, but the adapter that Azrit has created in the form of this XPO data service thing makes it extremely simple, and there's really nothing else to it than what you can see right here. Uh, to publish an OData service from an existing XPO data store, right? So that's uh, how easy that is. Now, one thing you might want to do with this is to use it with Silverlight. So that's one of the main examples that I can see myself, at least, and that I've actually used a little bit in the past with, with clients. Um, there are other ways, by the way, of interfacing XPO with Silverlight. So this is not the only one. You can you can access any other WCF published service, for example, or any other SOAP service, for instance, from Silverlight and use the, the other kind of uh, remote invocation system that I've uh, vaguely shown just a moment ago. Uh, but of course, using um, an OData service from Silverlight is quite simple. I basically went and added a service reference to this uh, service, to my Silverlight project right here, called it Orders Data. And then um, I put some code into my, um, in, into my data source class that's very similar to my WPF setup I had just a moment ago. And this initializes the connection to my OData service and creates a collection. Now, of course, you have to query all the data asynchronously and stuff in Silverlight. You know, if you've used Silverlight, you know your way around these things. It's a little difficult sometimes. But once you get it going, it's quite nice, really. And the result should be, if I run this, oh, and I want to do that in Internet Explorer again. Um, if I run this, it should go back to my uh, data service and retrieve my, my uh, products on the top level right here. I can click one of them and get some detailed information shown right here. Oh, we've got three of those finally. Okay. You know, retrieve the order lines related to, to the product information and so on. And this all goes back to my OData service now through this local connection basically to the same service that I was just using uh, directly from the browser, right? So this is another new way of working with, with XPO and it, I think it really shows nicely how XPO opens up to a variety of different uh, technologies these days. Really very cool. Right, so I think that's what I was going to show you right here. Um, and I suppose we've probably got a few more questions before I get to my little special XPO class deal, hoping that I've interested you in uh, some more XPO, perhaps. Meanwhile, Amanda, any questions? Uh, well, we've actually answered quite a few on the back end with the uh, dev team. But yeah. there's a question um, about. Um, in XPO, you use properties and strings, which is not refactor friendly. Is there another way to write those properties? Oh, you mean the thing here um, that I was doing in my types? Uh, let me see where are my types with the change notification. Presumably, that's what's meant here, right? Um, yes. Well, unfortunately, not really. I mean, this is not to do with XPO really, but the set property value function basically just uses the standard uh, I notify property changed. Uh, interface which requires you to pass through the name of the property as a string. You may like it or not, but that's how .NET works. It's not really an XPO thing. Uh, there are ways, uh, certainly, of automating this somehow. So basically, through the use of reflection, you know, generate a helper function that somehow figures out the name of the property automatically and somehow pipes it into um, into the uh, into the I notify property change infrastructure, uh, but that's not not something we like to recommend to be honest because it's a pretty quick and dirty solution in its own right. Uh, there used to be other overloads of set property value in the past that that had mechanisms like this included, uh, like like this automatic thing that I was just trying to summarize right there. 
and we actually removed them at a later point because we found that this was a, a pretty severe uh, performance penalty that you might encounter when property values are being set at a pretty high frequency, you see. So from that point of view, uh, I agree it's not the most uh, brilliant pattern in many ways, but it's a pattern enforced uh, by the standard .NET uh, change notification interfaces, and there's no really easy and, and uh, more flexible way around it. Uh, that's the last question that was up there, but um, one of our attendees is saying there's a DX Core plugin. I'm assuming he's saying it might help in this instance, but um, there is a DX Core plugin. Where there's, I don't think there's a DX Core plugin that changes this mechanism, but there are DX Core plugins to to deal with those properties and things like that. Yes, uh, there are two. I wrote one of them myself, and there's <laughs> another one that somebody wrote in between. Uh, but they have to do with a particular way of using querying with XPO that is, well, mostly outdated these days and in, in favor of uh, uh, link querying. And I, I'm not aware of any plugin that has directly to do with this change notification thing that we're talking about, but maybe that's a different connection right there. Uh, otherwise, that's it for questions. That's it for questions. Okay, no open questions. That's that's not good. Nobody's interested in more XPO. Oh no, we uh, well we've asked, <laughs> we've answered actually quite a few on the you back end, and you answered yes. some of them while you were you know obviously presenting your okay. second half. So sure I was. No, I saw some of the answers. So thanks to all the devs and support guys who were busy in the background, I saw uh, lots of things scrolling through. So <laughs> thank you very much to these guys. That was great. Now. Now, um, what else do I have? Oh, right, so here's my uh, special deal, a bit of a discount option for those of you who might consider coming to London in May, perhaps, you know, this is what it is. It's valid for a few days. You can hopefully find your way to that. Uh, I would certainly appreciate it. I like doing XPO. I hope you liked listening to me <laughs> talk about it. Uh, take note of whatever is in there and um, get back to me if you're interested. Unless anybody can come up with more things to discuss, I think I'm pretty much done. Um, my email address and everything would theoretically come on the next slide, but I'd rather leave it on this one here in case anybody wants to copy down those details. Otherwise, I think that's probably it from my side then. Um, you did have someone comment earlier or asking if they can find your class in Ecuador. I said you probably weren't opposed to traveling, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, well, theoretically speaking, if you look at my website, I offer all sorts of services, and I'm not generally opposed to coming to Ecuador or any place in the world, pretty much, <laughs> um, generally speaking. So if you want to get back to me and see, maybe we can set something up. I don't know. I never say no to any of these questions, really. There aren't any classes uh, planned in, in Ecuador anytime soon, to be honest. I've mainly had uh, fixed classroom-style classes uh, set up in Europe. Europe uh, in recent times um, because of economical things as well and so on. I think I might do something later this year in the US. I uh, haven't finalized any of the details of that yet. So watch my blog one more time um, and my, my website with the DevExpress Dev classes and everything for details. Uh, an ASP.NET class is going to come up there pretty soon, but first, uh, the, the first incarnation of it will be in Europe again, unfortunately. So if you're listening from the US, I do apologize. I hope to be able to give you something later this year, but right now it's, it's focused on Europe. You know, feel free to get back to me any time if there's anything I can help you with in any case. Maybe we can set something up. Awesome. Thank you, Oliver. Um, and we have one more webinar this week, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Functional Testing Deep Dive in XAF with XAF Evangelist Gary Short. Everything can be measured, everything that can be measured can be improved, and XAF is no exception. In this webinar, Gary will show you how to use the inbuilt testing framework that ships with XAF to ensure your products are as good as they can be. You can visit devexpress.com slash webinars and register away. And again, if you missed anything from this webinar or you want to review any of our previous webinars, you can check us out on the DevExpress channel at tv.devexpress.com. Again, thank you, Oliver, for being here. I actually wanted to comment. I loved your um, positive reinforcements that you give yourself throughout. You, you the <laughs> man, and... Oh, yes, of course. Oh, that's my instant <laughs> gratification plugin. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. if you're a VX Core user, you can download that one from my blog and use it yourself. Brilliant, That's eh? so funny. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> um, all right, thank you, Oliver, for being here. Um, thank, you. thank you to the uh, dev team also for uh, doing all that hard work on the back end. And thank you all for joining us, and thanks for choosing DevExpress.